Hello and welcome to The Virus. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. Two and a half years after it was first declared, the World Health Organization says COVID remains a global emergency and that the pandemic is nowhere near over. However, while COVID cases and hospitalizations are again climbing, state governments are resisting reintroducing mask mandates, although the Victorian and Queensland governments are encouraging people to wear masks. Coming up, we hear from the New South Wales Chief Health Officer, Dr Kerry Chant. But first, here's Casey Briggs. Jeremy, the number of deaths being reported in Australia with COVID-19, it's been kind of sitting, as we've been saying, week after week in the mid-40s, the high 40s for a very long time. We've just on Friday seen it lift again above 50. That's the first time we've seen that in a few weeks. But today I wanted to focus uh, mainly on hospitalisation numbers. We've now got more than 4,500 people in hospital with COVID-19 in Australia, but we know these numbers, they don't necessarily mean the same thing they did last year. For one, uh, this number includes those people who are in hospital with COVID, but they're not being treated because uh, of their COVID diagnosis. They're in for some other uh, reason. And the number of people in that group we think has been rising through this wave. We we don't have good national numbers. Victoria's health department isn't tracking a breakdown of this. New South Wales Health, well, I've asked them and they haven't got back to me. But one state that is tracking this breakdown is Tasmania, one of the smaller states. And we can see here all of their public hospital COVID admissions back to the beginning of the year. The red, that's the people who are being treated specifically for COVID-19. The yellow, uh, they're people who, are, who have COVID, but they were admitted to hospital for some other reason. They're being treated for some other condition. And you can see that has shot up quite quickly in just a few weeks. And it's going up faster than it is uh, for that red group. Here's another way of visualising it. This is the percentage of hospital admissions who are being with COVID who are being treated specifically for COVID. At the beginning of the year, that number was 50, 60, even 70% of admissions. In the second quarter of the year, maybe 40% was more uh, like the typical. Uh, and really since about June, we're seeing a downward trend. Uh, at the moment, about 25, 30% of admissions on any given day uh, are people being treated specifically for COVID. That's not to say that this hospital challenge or this wave isn't, you know, a challenge for our health systems. Plainly, you've got hospitals talking about deferring uh, surgery, so plainly there is a challenge there, but it's a different challenge to what we were talking about uh, last year at this time. Back then, we were worried about the number of people who were seriously ill with COVID. Today, we're also not so much worried about that as we are also worried about all of the people who are in hospital for other reasons and also happen to have uh, COVID-19. And Jeremy, I think that figure and that kind of breakdown from Tasmania does go some way to explaining why, even as the overall hospital admissions are growing relatively quickly in Australia, the number of intensive care beds being occupied by COVID-19 patients has remained relatively stable and relatively low. Casey, thank you. The New South Wales Chief Health Officer is Dr Kerry Chant and she joins us now. Dr Chant, welcome to the virus. Thank you, Jeremy. Now, subvariants are one of the big unknowns right now. Just who should be worried? I think we've all got a part to play in um, reducing the spread of the new variant B4, B5, which is leading to an uptick in cases and an uptick in hospitalisations. But the people that are most impacted are going to be those that are elderly and those with underlying health conditions. But it's important that we all, as I said, have a part to play in reducing the spread and keeping others around us safe. Messaging throughout the pandemic has been kind of messy all over Australia. How well do you rate the quality of messaging to those people who are at risk right now? I think we've been really trying to improve the simplicity of our messages so that they can reach the most um, vulnerable, but it's really complex science. The messages have changed over time, so I really acknowledge how difficult it has been to, for members of the public to sort of keep up to date with the recommendations. Um, so I agree that that's a, keeping the messages simple, um, keeping the messages consistent is will actually help us um, achieve better outcomes. You signed off recently on allowing unvaccinated people to visit aged care homes from next week. That brings New South Wales in line with Queensland and Victoria. What prompted that change? I think it's about responding to the science and the evidence. We don't use public health orders lightly and we have to justify 
um, those measures. And I think it's really important that the community understands that the vaccines are holding up very well at protecting us against hospitalisation and death and severe disease from COVID, but they aren't holding up so well in protecting us against infection. And I think the community needs to be told that and understand that because otherwise they're under that false impression that just because they're up to date with the vaccinations, they can't get COVID, which is not correct. But again, I want to reinforce that the vaccines are incredibly effective at keeping us safe through reducing our hospitalisation and risk of death. That risk of infection translates, evidence we see around the world, translates to greater exposure to death uh, for people living in aged care facilities. Is that the trade-off then, the freedom of movement to enter an aged care facility if you're unvaccinated and that some people will die as a result? I think what we need to understand is that in 2022, we're actually balancing a variety of risks and the risks, I suppose the message that I would like to convey is both unvaccinated and vaccinated individuals can introduce COVID into aged care facilities. It's very important that we understand that they are um, very vulnerable environments if infection is introduced. And we put in a suite of measures to prevent that introduction. The first is clear messaging um, around people being aware not to go there with the most minimal of symptoms, please don't go there. We also can add the additional layer of requesting people to do a, rat a rapid antigen test before they enter aged care facilities. Also wearing masks. It's important also to um, pot potentially choose outdoor environments if that's possible, given the, given the environment within the aged care facilities and the mobility of the resident. And certainly avoid those shared areas just so that we reduce that interactional mingling risk. It remains open for aged care facilities, clinics, hospitals to administer their own measures to keep uh, COVID out. Is that what it comes down to, that doctors and leaders in the health system are going to manage their own patches and decide what works best for them? New South Wales Health has worked to provide guidance, but obviously individual practices can make their own decisions about, um, about the steps they need to take to keep it keep it safe. And we do also respect that there'll be just individual circumstances, different vulnerabilities, different designs of premises in terms of the measures that they can take. But we do provide quite clear and consistent advice about the risk reduction strategies that can be put in place. You recently asked for people to start wearing masks again in certain settings, even though it's not mandatory. Your position hasn't really changed on that, but what's politically palatable has changed. There seems to be a fork in the road in who we listen to about how we live with COVID, the health experts and the politicians. It's the politicians who are in charge. Is that frustrating to you? I think the evidence is clear that we know the tools that can reduce the impact of COVID. And we know that when we have high levels of community transmission, we then have issues around absenteeism of staff in critical industries. We also have challenges in keeping COVID out of very vulnerable settings like hospitals. For me, I need to inform the community that wearing masks in indoor places um, is going to be one significant risk reduction strategy. And it is important that we consider our role in reducing the spread as a community. It's important that we do that at scale to have the impact. And I'm confident that with us getting those messages out, many members of the community will increase their mask wearing. Is there not a fundamental contradiction in that messaging that you spoke about earlier that it was very important to get clear that we want you to do this but we're not going to make you do it but these are the consequences and you know it's up to you to kind of you know self-administer these measures. Is that not kind of a lack of clarity in messaging? I think it's very clear what I'm asking the community to do and I'm informing them of the benefits of those actions. I think we do need the community to act and really our other decisions are a matter for government. But it is clear that mask wearing, indoor mask wearing is an effective intervention, but it needs to be done at scale. Um, whilst it does afford individual protection, the best situation is when 
other people are all around you are also wearing masks. How much should the health advice continue to govern how we live our lives right now? I'm actually um, positive that many people are following the health advice and I think it is important that we get the message around the updated ATAGI advice in relation to boosters and the importance of booster doses. I think it's also important that, that the extended expanded access to antivirals is known and I would urge anyone with underlying health conditions, severe immunocompromise, to check with their doctor about whether they're eligible to antivirals and have a plan ahead of getting COVID, as we do anticipate that cases will increase in the coming weeks to months. Dr Chant, you say that people kind of get it, but we have this discussion now about mask wearing, we've got an outbreak on a cruise ship, we've got a declining uptake of boosters. That doesn't say that people are getting it and that they're following the health advice necessarily. So I think that, um, Jeremy, that was an excellent question, um, but I think it's also important for us to be very clear with the community that evidence has changed and therefore the messages have changed. And communicating different messages and changing mes messages is always a challenge and one that we need to continue to learn how to do better. Last year, we were calling on people to get vaccinated two doses, but for the Omicron variant, I'm very clear we need three, or in some cases four, or for some five doses to be adequately protected or what we term up to date. Also, the, as the evidence and confidence in the antivirals has grown, we therefore have seen the announcement of expanded criterion for who is eligible for those antivirals. We've also known about waning immunity from infection and, the re and vaccination and we've decreased the reinfection period down to 28 days after release from isolation. So we have responded to the evidence changing. We need to re-communicate those messages and build an understanding in the community that the reason we're changing those messages is not because we got it wrong at one point in time, but in fact, because the evidence has evolved or in the case of Omicron, the virus has changed. And would you accept that those messages right now are not getting through to the same scale that you would like? We are redoubling our efforts in trying to ensure that we are fully using the suite of tools we have. And that's vaccination, it's antivirals, it's stay at home when you're sick, get tested, ice and those public health measures such as wearing masks, ventilation, um, trying to and choosing those settings where ventilation is good, particularly if you're going to have encounters with vulnerable individuals. So it's really not one thing, it's the suite of tools we have available to them to use and it's important we use all of them. How do you feel about this notion of living with COVID? So I think that what living with COVID means is not that we can ignore it, and it doesn't mean that we can behave in the ways that we did um, prior to the existence of COVID. We are going to experience um, this current wave and potentially future, future waves. At the moment, we are keeping a watchful look at another variant, 2.75, BA 2.75. So waves are to be anticipated. Um, we have the tools, um, we know how it's transmitted, we know how to protect ourselves and we need to use those full suite of tools. We need to inform the community when the risk level is, uh, is increasing and we need to put those protective behaviours in place. I think fundamentally um, we will be continuing to wear masks in healthcare settings and pharmac pharmacies and other settings will be the advice for very much the future. And it is important to understand that living with COVID doesn't mean, as I said, that we can ignore it or going back to what it was before the existence of COVID. Dr Kerry Chant, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. And that's the show for this week. Thanks for your company. Bye for now.